The Spectral Estate by Thomas Ligotti Read by Jeff Clark One may be alone in the house and yet not alone. There are so many rooms, so many galleries and mysteries, so many places where a peculiar quiet resounds with secrets. Every object and surface of the house seems darkly vibrant a medium for distant agitations which are felt but not always seen or heard. Dusty chandeliers send a stirring through the air above. Walls ripple within patterns of raised filigree. Grimy portraits shudder inside their gilded frames. And even if the light throughout much of the house has grown stale and become a sepia haze, it nevertheless remains a haze in ferment a fidgeting aura that envelops this museum of tremulous antiquities. Thus, one may be alone in the house and yet not alone, especially when it is a remote edifice which clings to the very edge of the land and hovers above a frigid ocean. Through an upper window is a view of coastal earth falling away into gray heaving waters. The lower windows of the house all look into the rustling depths of a garden long overgrown and sprouting in prolific tangles. A narrow path leads through this chaotic luxuriance, ending at the border of a dense wood which is aroused to life by a mild but perpetual wind. Ocean, garden, and wooded surroundings, all possessed by a visible turbulence which echoes the unseen tremors within the house itself. And when night masks the movements of this landscape, it is the stars that shiver around a livid, palpitant moon. Yet one may not believe there is an exchange of influence between the house and the world around it, and still there is a presence that pervades each as though there were no walls to divide them. From the moment one arrives at such a house there seems to be something moving in the background of its scenes, a hidden company whose nature is unknown. No true peace can establish itself in these rooms, however long they have remained alone with their own emptiness, abandoned to lie dormant and dreamless. Throughout the most innocent mornings and unclouded afternoons there endures a kind of restless pulling at appearances an awkward or expert fussing with the facade of objects. In the night a tide of shadows invades the house, submerging its rooms in a darkness which allows a greater freedom to these fitful maneuverings. And perhaps there is a certain room toward the very summit of the house, a room where one may sense how deeply the house is penetrated into a far greater estate, a landscape which is without boundaries either above or below, an infinite architecture whose interior is as tortuous and vast as its exterior. The room is long and large and features a row of double doors along the full length of one wall, doors which lead out to a narrow terrace overlooking the ocean and staring straight into the sky, and each door is composed of a double row of window panes opening the room to the images of the expansive world outside it and allowing the least possible division between them. There are no working light fixtures in this room, so that it necessarily shares in the luminous moods of the day or night beyond the windows. Discovering this chamber on a certain overcast afternoon, one settles into an apartment that itself is hung with clouds and enveloped by dull twilight for endless hours, and yet the room appears to gain all the depth that the day has lost, whereas the sky has been foreshortened by a low ceiling of soft gray clouds, the dim corners and shaded furnishings reach into immense realms, great wells and hollows beyond vision. Certainly the echoes one hears must be resonating in places outside that room, which muffles one's movements with its thick and densely figured carpet, its plump upholstered chairs, and its maze of tables, cases, and cabinets in dark, weighty wood. For in this constricted setting, echoes emerge which only a void of supernatural dimensions could create. Yet at first they may sound like the reverberant groaning of those clouds in which a storm slumbers. 
and then they may seem to mimic the hissing of the ocean as it swirls about the broken land below. Slowly, however, the echoes distinguish themselves from these natural sounds and attain their own voice, a voice that carries across incredible distances, a voice whose words come to lose their stratum of sense, a voice that is dissolving into sighs and sobs and chattering insanity. Every niche, every pattern, every shadow of the room is eloquent with this voice. And one's attention may be distracted by this strange soliloquy, this uncanny music. Thus, one may not notice, as afternoon approaches nightfall, that something else is present in the room, something which has been secreted out of sight and waits to rise up in the shape of a revelation, to rise up like a cry in one's own throat. Such phenomena may be quite severe in their effects, leaving their witness in a perilous orientation between two worlds, one of which is imposing its madness and its mysteries on the other. We feel the proximity of a darkness beyond earthly reason, of a cryptic land of dreams whose shadows mingle with our own, breathing their intense life into the airless world of the mundane. For a time we are content to reside within that metaphysical twilight and delve deep into its hues. Long exasperated by questions without answers, by answers without consequences, by truths which change nothing, we learn to become intoxicated by the mood of mystery itself, by the odor of the unknown. We are entranced by the subtle sense and wavering reflections of the unimaginable. In the beginning it is not our intention to seek order within madness or to give a name to certain mysteries. We are not concerned with creating a system out of the strangeness of that house. What we seek, in all its primitive purity, is the company of the spectral. But ultimately, as if possessed by some fatal instinct, we succumb to the spirit of intrigue and attempt to find a drab focus for the amorphous glories we have inherited. We are like the man who, by some legacy of fate, has come to stay in another old house, one very much like our own. After passing a short time within the cavernous and elaborate solitude of the place, he becomes a spectator to strange sights and sounds. He then begins to doubt his sanity, and at last flees the advancing shadows of the house for the bright shelter of a nearby town. There, amid the good society of the local citizens, he learns the full history of the house. It seems that long ago some tragedy occurred, an irreparable melodrama that has continued to be staged many years after the deaths of the actors involved. Others who have lived in the house have witnessed the same eerie events, and its most recent guest is greatly relieved by this knowledge. Faith in his mental soundness has been triumphantly restored. It is the house itself which is mad. But this man need not have been so comforted. If the spectral drama could be traced to definite origins, and others have been audience to it, this is not to prove that all testimony regarding the house is unmarked by madness. Rather, it suggests a greater derangement, a conspiracy of unreason implicating a plurality of lunatics, a delirium that encompasses past and present houses and mines, the claustrophobic cellars of the soul and the endless spaces outside it. For we are the specters of a madness that surpasses ourselves and hides in mystery. And though we search for sense throughout endless rooms, all we may find is a voice whispering from a mirror in a house that belongs to no one.